we're in this incredibly interesting time right now where there are more rabbis writing accessible books for a lay audience than any time in the last 50 years. Um, this spring, Rabbi Shai Held and Rabbi Sharon Browse, two of the most important and thoughtful and creative rabbis, both have new books coming out. Um, Noah Feldman, while not a rabbi, is a serious learned Jew, teaches at Harvard Law School. He has a book coming out this spring as well. There's just an enormous amount of Jewish wisdom being written for a lay audience, for people who are not specialists, who don't necessarily speak Hebrew. And Rabbi Sharon Browse's book, I think, is, uh, is significant and interesting. And not just because it's a very smart book, but because she is a rabbi whom people pay attention to. The congregation that she started in Los Angeles a couple decades ago, ICAR, uh, now has a membership list of thousands. Uh, it's one of the most thriving and busy congregations in the country. And a lot of them are people who never belonged to a congregation before. A lot of them were unchurched, to use a, uh, an inappropriate word. And so the reality that there's something about her message that resonates with people who didn't think they wanted to be part of a synagogue community, I think is really important. What's extra interesting about this book is that it actually starts from a sermon that she gave saying the community needed to be more. So there she was a number of years ago with this thriving congregation, lots and lots of people showing up. And she gave a sermon called The Amen Effect where she said, look, we're doing a lot for social justice. We're doing a lot for the outside world, but we're actually not doing enough for each other. We're not showing up for each other's funerals and weddings enough. And we have to actually care for each other more. We have to visit each other in the hospital more. So the book began with a call to action to her own congregation. And now she's turned it into a call to action for everyone. And I think that makes it a significant conversation that I had with Sharon Browse. Rabbi Browse, thank you for joining yeah, us. Thank you for having me. Congrats on the book. Thank you. OK, so what's the Amen Effect? OK. You have a book called The Amen Effect. Yes, I do. What's that? So here's the premise of the book, okay. that we are living through a time in which we're essentially standing at the intersection of multiple crises, the loneliness crisis. We are lonelier, more, um, more alienated, more isolated from one another um, than the spirit and the society can bear. We are living through a moment of really fierce political polarization and ideological extremism. And the combination of these factors is essentially breaking us. It's breaking our spirits, it's breaking our hearts, and it threatens to break our democracy. And sometimes when we face so many intersecting crises at once, it leaves us feeling really powerless, but actually we are not powerless because there are some things that we can, and I argue we really must do, in order to turn the tide of what's going on right now. And very simply, many of those fall under the overriding theme of, we actually have to learn how to show up for one another. We have to learn how to show up in celebration, in sorrow, and in solidarity. And especially in the moments when we feel most uh, the most urgent need to pull away from each other, we have to actually turn toward each other. So that's the amen effect. What would happen in our society um, and in our hearts if we could see each other in the fullness of our human experiences and actually say amen or amen or amin to one another's pain, to one another's joy, and to one another's love? Could, could we not envision that that might actually change our lives and the world? Okay, but how do we do it? You you say pretty far into the book, you have a term that I that I really liked, which is you say it's the ritualization of care. Yes. You say the amen effect yeah. is the ritualization of care. Mm -hmm. And then you give advice. You say here here's actually how that works out, that plays out in practice. Because no one's against loving people. We're all for we're all pro loving people. In theory. In theory, in theory. we're all pro love. Until actual humans are involved. Right. And then but we, in yeah. theory, but <laughs> no one's anti love, right? <laughs> so what does it mean? What is the ritualization of care? Okay, so can I take a step back and yeah. give us a little way okay. back? Because not, not everyone here has read the book yet. So, um, so the book is it came, out, it came out four days ago. Five. Yeah, okay, right. so cut right. them some slack. So, they will. There's readers okay. and future No readers. guilt. Right. No guilt about this. I'll guilt you about other things. Okay. Um, so, so the book is actually rooted in one particular ancient ritual, which appears in a Mishnah. Mishnah, uh, the oral law, the, in, a compendium of Jewish law that was codified around the year 220 CE. 
And this is a fairly obscure Mishnah, or at least it was before my book. So now hopefully more people will know about this Mishnah. I, I heard um, the other day, I got a Google alert because some, uh, some pastor somewhere in the Midwest gave a sermon about this Mishnah. And um, so chapter two, exactly, like popped exactly. on your Google alert. Yes. Right. And then, and then, uh, and he did quote me at the end of his sermon, which was nice. Um, so it, it's not, might not be so obscure anymore. But the idea of this Mishnah is that in ancient times, Jews would come from all over the land and also from the diaspora. They would ascend to Jerusalem, a city on a hill. They would then climb up the steps of the Temple Mount. They would enter this giant, grand uh, entryway into the Temple Mount. They would turn to the right and they would circle en masse. And this happened, imagine the pilgrimage festivals when this would happen with hundreds of thousands of people at once, turning from the right all the way around, circling around the perimeter of the courtyard and exiting essentially right where they had just entered. And, and there, this mass movement of people, the only way that I can really understand this is to think about the Hajj and Mecca, because we've seen these images of pilgrimage from the, to the, you know, when people go to Mecca. And it's just this enormous, mass of humans moving collectively. And part of the, the spiritual impact of that experience is that you're part of humanity in some incredible way. And you might save up your whole life and pray your whole life for the opportunity to go do this. Except the text says, for somebody who's heartbroken, when your heart is broken, you still go up to Jerusalem, you still climb the steps at the Temple Mount, but when everyone else turns to the right and walks around, you turn to the left and you walk in the opposite direction of literally everyone else. And every single person who passes you has to stop and see you, look in your eyes and say in the Hebrew, Malach, what happened to you? What's your story? Tell me about your heartache. Why are you walking this way when the whole world's going this way? And then you answer saying, I am a mourner or I am worried sick about my kid or my husband just left and I had no idea that this was coming. I did not see this coming or I'm just so lonely. I just feel so broken in this world. And then the person who's going this way gives them a blessing, just stops and says, may the one who dwells in this place give you comfort. May you find consolation among all of the bereaved. May you be held with love in this moment of brokenheartedness. And then they go on. And what I realized about this Mishnah years and years ago is that what's essentially happening in this sacred encounter is that all of the parties do not want to be doing what they're doing. The people who are A-OK -okay that day because they finally made it to Jerusalem and they're part of the mass of humanity that's moving in one seamless direction, they do not want to stop and see this brokenhearted person who's coming in bleary-eyed, you know, having just like cried for days on days on end, who's walking at a different pace and in a different direction and ask that poor person, what happened to you? And the person who's broken does not even want to get out of bed, let alone get dressed and show up in this sacred place and show the whole world that I am not okay. And yet that's exactly what the ancient ritual calls us to do. And so the, the, essentially the whole book is trying to unpack different angles of that sacred ritual. What happens when we are desperate to retreat from one another because our hearts are broken or we know that their heart is broken and we don't want to be with them? but we're actually called to create the context of sacred community so that we can hold each other with love instead of turn our back on one another. Because remember where we started, turning our back on one another is actually what's breaking us. It's breaking our spirits. And now, of course, there's a whole liturgy that we, you know, a, a whole, excuse me, <laughs> there's a whole literature about how loneliness and social dis disconnection is actually destroying our bodies and destroying our communities. And so we know we need to find our way to each other. None of us actually want to, and it's precisely in the moments that we don't want to that we have to. So the ritualization of care is about actually um, formalizing a commitment to seeing others when we don't want to see them and creating practices that bring us into relationship when all we want to do is pull away from relationship, creating communities of care that are oriented around finding our way to each other, especially when we feel repelled by one another. So, I mean, the, the big example that you use a lot of is funerals. 
because yeah. most people don't want to go to funerals. Yeah. And including the people, <laughs> including the mourners often don't want to. I mean, it's, it's often a hard time for everyone. You tell a story about when you fell down on the job and with Rabbi Marcello. Do you want to just share that with everyone? There are a lot of stories in this book of me falling down on the yeah, job. Yeah, uh, well, so, let's, let's okay. pick this one. It was with your, right. one of your mentors, Marcello yeah, Bronstein. So, so my, I mean, first of all, my grandma had this rule that I talk about in chapter one. My grandma's rule was you go to the simcha. You just go to the celebration. It doesn't matter how busy you are, that you're facing a deadline. If your friend's kid is you know, becoming bar mitzvah, you find a way to get there. Because my grandma used to say, that it like if god forbid you would go for the funeral you've got to show up for the joy and i love that rule and i was raised by that you know to really live by that rule and then i realized at some point that my grandma's assumption was of course you'll go to the funeral and that we can't share that assumption so my rabbi marcella bronstein absolutely brilliant rabbi um who's uh from argentina and i was at b'nai jeshurun with him in new york city and then I moved out to LA and I'd been out to LA for, for a few years when his mother died. And, you know, Marcelo is one of the most beloved rabbis in the country. I just imagined him completely surrounded by love after his mother's death. In fact, a little bit burdened maybe by all the love that was in his, in his home. And I felt like I'm not going to add to the burden. Um, I, I, so I wrote him a letter. And I put it in the mail, like an old fashioned handwritten letter. And I sent it to him. I didn't pick up the phone and I certainly did not fly to New York. Anyway, then I saw him a few months later and Marcelo said to me, Sharon, you weren't there when I needed you. And he said, next time show up. And I was devastated and embarrassed and angry and righteous. And I was like, who is he to tell me? And I have little kids and I'm running a community here in LA. And I realized at some point that he was right and that I should have shown up. And if you can't fly to the funeral, you at least need to pick up the phone and not be afraid to call the person and just say, I love you. And I'm so sorry about the death of your mother. What are you going to say? I was just going to say, I found this haunting partly because about two weeks ago, a friend of mine from my synagogue lost her grandmother and there was Shiva half a mile from my house. Mm. And for various reasons having to do with, again, being a dad and, you know, I have carpool to drive. I didn't go. Mm -hmm. And it was her grandmother, not her mother, and but nevertheless, and I wrote a letter and I put it in the mail and I thought, look at how classy I am writing a letter on my stationery or whatever. And then I have to read your book, which is like saying <laughs> I completely <laughs> I completely dropped the ball. Oh. <laughs> so, you know, it came to me for like for such a time as this, your book telling me I should have gone to the funeral, which I should have. I did want to ask though, and this is this is a perhaps take yes, you know, it's a bit of a tangent. Um that's pretty cutting of him to call you out on yeah. that. Would you, I mean, would you I do would, that to someone? Now I would call that love. Yeah. I mean, I think that he loved me enough to say to me, you didn't handle this the way that you should have. And I speak in the, um, in one of the chapters about uh, the first human, Adam Harishon, um, in the beginning of Genesis, Adam. And Adam, the first time, you know, when, when, when the creation begins, everything's good. It's good. It's good. It's good. It's really good. The first thing that's not good is it's not good for a person to be alone. And, um, and so God needs to create a partner for, for Adam. And that's when Eve comes into the world. And Eve is built to be his Ezer Konegdo, to help him by being opposite him, right? And I've always thought about that as a kind of expression of what real partnership is, which is your partner's not only there to tell you how wonderful you are, your partner's there to sometimes oppose you and say, I don't think that's your best thinking. I think you can do better than that. I don't think you handled that very well. And I love you enough to tell you that. Um, that's really hard to do. But those are, the, those are the friendships. I'm not just talking about marriage. I'm talking about the friendships that really move us and change us are the people who love us enough to say, like, I'm uncomfortable by something that happened. I need to share it with you. And if we're big enough to see that, um, we might actually grow from them. Those are the relationships that can help us grow. Then, by the way, um, there's an incredible midrash that I talked about in chapter two, in which the, at the end of the first day of creation, after Eve has, after Adam's been created and then got, you know, was lonely and then Eve is created, it's a wonderful day. And then all of a sudden the sun starts to set. And that is not wonderful because Adam and Eve have never seen darkness before in their lives. And Adam starts to freak out because he thinks that the world is ending. 
And he thinks it's his fault, as many of us do when we encounter darkness, especially for the first time. And he starts to blame himself and weep and wail and cry and scream. And Eve comes over to him and sits Kenegedlo across from him. And it's not an accident that the rabbis who wrote this midrash use the same language that, the, that is used in the Torah and sits across from him and holds him. And they both weep together throughout the long night. And one of the most foundational questions that I think we ask ourselves as human beings is, who will weep with you through the night? Because the darkness is inevitable. Mm -hmm. It will come. And who will be there to sit across from you and, and just hold you through the night? And Adam survives that first night because somebody is willing to be his real partner and to actually see him in the darkest moments. One of the things you talk a lot in this book about is the, the physical showing up. I mean, I, when you say the ritualization of care, yeah. a lot of what you're talking about is you have to go to the shiva, you have to go to the bris, you have to actually show up. We're just coming out of a period of several years in which people showed up probably less than ever mm -hmm. in the past century because of, because of pandemic. And a lot of communities, um, rabbis are reporting that people don't want to come back out again. Yeah. And I always take it as foundational to Judaism that you know we don't, we don't exalt the person who goes off in the woods by themselves. We don't have hermits. Um, we say a Jewish life can only be lived with groups of 10 other yeah. people at, at least, right? So this is a huge problem for Judaism, right? I mean, the, the retreat into people's homes and onto Zoom screens, mm -hmm. you know, it's rabbis have to be pretty delicate with this because on the one hand, I don't know what your shul's practice is, but a lot of rabbis with large communities are streaming their services and saying, we get 10,000 people. We used to get 1,000. Now we get 10,000. They talk about how great it is. And your book seems to be saying, if you can't get 10 people for Shiva, you're actually falling down. So like, how do, how do we think about this tension? Okay, so a couple things. First, um, I, this to really took me by surprise because I was very strongly opposed to streaming services before for precisely this reason. And then when COVID came, we really had no choice. And um, and I, I mean, I realized at some point right around Pesach, which was, you know, if COVID came at March. Purim, yeah. right? So between Purim and Pesach, I am, there was about five weeks there when I was like, we're not, I'm not going to do this. I don't feel comfortable. I don't use technology, et cetera. Anyway, and then I realized right around Passover that this wasn't going to end in another two weeks. And also that we had trained people to show up for each other. And so I couldn't, we couldn't pull away the community at precisely the moment that people were hurting perhaps more than they had ever hurt before. And so we started to find our way to each other online. I mean, actually we had had some uh, experiences before that with some singing together, but I wasn't a part of it and the other rabbis weren't a part of it. And I realized we had to find our way. And so I just, this is all for my way of saying what I've been stunned by and moved by is that people can actually show up for each other online in ways that I never thought was possible. And I have a lot to say about technology and the way that technology is destroying our spirits and destroying our society. But I have to say that my dearest friend and partner, Melissa, uh, Melissa's father died right when COVID started. And yours was the first COVID shiva and uh, th that we had and we found each other and we and we comforted i hope your family and you and each other through the screen and many people after that the only option that they had was finding each other through the screen so i don't think it's impossible to have a really meaningful connection on the screen in fact that first high holy days when we were all i mean each one of us we had a, a setup where each one of us was in our own classroom in his high school and we were like all seeing you know all we could see was people on the screen who were in their own living rooms around the world and it was a very surreal experience for all of us and there was one point where we got to one prayer during Musaf um, on Yom Kippur and it's a time where frankly at Ikar people just go I mean like they're it, in the depths of our fast, people are like feet off the ground, ecstasy and joy and like the most beautiful, raucous spirit that I have ever experienced in any, you know, religious context. And, um, and so that I was dreading that prayer because I thought, how can we reach that kind of joy in the midst of COVID with death all around us and total isolation? And at one point I looked up and they had placed this screen in the room so I could see the people on Zoom. And I just saw literally hundreds of people in their living rooms 
around the world, like jumping up and down, experiencing, and then people were fueling each other's joy. And it was an incredible lesson for me about the power of connection. We can actually connect through technology. And there is no substitute for connecting in person. It is the power. I mean, this is, this is an ancient wisdom that we need to find nine other people in order to grieve, you know, and, um, and so I don't, I was never worried that people wouldn't come back afterwards because I know that once you've experienced the power of being in the room with others, you will do anything you can to get back in that room to, if, if you can do it safely. So, um, and for us, we have found that people are coming back because they, you you can't make harmony on zoom, right? Like you can't, I, 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 that was one of the things I missed most during that period was that we couldn't harmonize and like we need harmony. We need to hear we need to hear the way that voices find each other um, and then lift each other up. And so I do that you're right that that COVID was a major hit. And um, I think that people, I trust that people are finding their way back to where they need to be. Um, a good part of your book is taken up with the question of how do we show up physically for people who who might hate us. Mm. And of course, the, the, the Mishnah, as you know, as you write about, isn't just, there, there's, when you're passing someone coming the other way, it might be that they're very broken and they might be going in that direction because they've been excommunicated yes. or shunned. Yes. And those are people who might be, have been shunned because they were anti-Semitic or because they harmed the community or because they betrayed trust or yeah. whatever. And so a bunch of, most of your book, I would say, is how do we show up for people who are hurting but yeah. whom we love and have every reason to love? A good part of your book is how do we show up for people who are hurting or hurtful and who haven't necessarily seen the error of their ways and who right. might, it right. might be easy to just write out of the circle forever. Yeah. And you talk, for example, about the um, the example of Derek Black, whose father was some sort of wizard in the KKK. I can never remember if they're Grim. wizards or dragons yeah. or griffins or whatever they are, but he was something like that. <laughs> and he wrote this wonderful book, Rising, or he was written about in this wonderful book, Rising Out of Hatred, which described how he came to reject his family's legacy of white supremacism because a community of Jewish students at New College in Florida kept inviting him to Shabbat yeah. dinners. And yeah. over many, many months, he finally realized, wait, I like these people. Maybe everything my dad told me was wrong and so forth. And it was these Jews who just kept loving him yeah. despite himself, who loved him into being lovable. And then you say, we're not, we can't all be doing that. Some of us would feel unsafe in his presence, but some, but but some of us have to do it. I mean, you, you land in a place that I think is a little conflicted where you think it's necessary, but you're not going to tell people it's an obligation. Yeah. It, it, how, like, how would you counsel? I can defend that position. Can you defend that position? Yeah, I can. Yeah, go ahead. I can. Because, um, so, so what Mark's referencing is that in the Mishnah, it, the, the first seven chapters talk about the Avel, the mourner who's walking to the left. But the, but the last chapter I... I reveal, and not not to give it away, and you should still read the book, that that actually the second example that's given in the Mishnah is called a minudeh, someone who is put into nidui, which is a form of ostracization that is just one step short of excommunication. You don't get put into ostracization for nothing. You've done something in word or in deed that has harmed the community and separated you from the community. And what's amazing about this, what is amazing, what we should all struggle with is that the menu debt is someone who you are, we, like the community is not allowed to stand within six feet of, a men, of someone who's a menuda. We are not allowed to be in physical proximity to them. They are that toxic to the dynamic of the community. And yet they go up to Jerusalem and they go up the steps and they enter the same sacred space that hundreds of thousands of other people are coming, but they walk in the direction of the brokenhearted. And when they do, they are met by the same gaze that meets the eyes of the bereaved. Someone looks into their eyes and says, tell me your story. What happened to you? And by the way, I spoke, spoke about my book with Father Greg Boyle of Homeboy Industries, and he speaks about what it means to take former gang members and rehumanize them by looking at them and saying, I see you as a human being, which is exactly what the rabbis were saying that we needed to do, to look into someone's eyes and to ask them, what does it look like from your vantage point? Because it's very different. We're walking in opposite directions and then to hear them and then to bless them. 
and to say, may you be welcomed back into community with love, or may you have a change of heart that would merit you re-entering community with love, but they get a blessing too. And so I feel so challenged by that. They're not even supposed to be in the same space, and yet they are, because they're still humans. And so what, is that, what does that mean for us? Like, how, how are we to find our way to one another? And so what I say about Derek Black is, I would not have invited Derek Black into my Shabbos dinner. I wouldn't have felt safe with my Jewish kids at my Shabbos table having a Nazi in the room. I would not have felt safe. Wouldn't have felt safe because you think he would have attacked you then and there? Maybe physically attacked me. Maybe maybe said things that would make my children feel less human than they are, less proud of their Judaism than they should be. I would not have felt safe. But thank God the, there was someone who did, right? Now, one of the rules of this era that we're living in is that the work is not on everyone. Not everybody can teach a racist to not be a racist, and not everyone can teach an anti-Semite to do better when it comes to Jews, but some people can. And I believe that part of that has to do with our proximity to trauma and to pain. So when we are in the midst, in the depths of, uh, of pain, and when we are actually unsafe because of another person's perspective, it is not our job to change them. Our job is to get safe and to protect our beloveds from the danger of those toxic views. But sometimes we do have a little bit more safety and we can actually engage ideas that are really uncomfortable, but won't endanger our lives. And when we can do that, we must. And I share a couple of stories in the book where I entered those uncomfortable conversations where I knew that I would be safe. I knew I would be uncomfortable, I would be agitated, I would be frustrated, I would be aggrieved, but I would, I would leave that room safely, whereas if I lived in a different body, I might not. And so I felt that it was my work to actually go sit in those conversations. And it might have to do with identity, it might have to do with, um, with the continuum of time. Like when you're in immediate grief, trauma, and fear, it is not necessarily safe to build bridges. But when you have a little bit more distance, either geographical distance or the time, it might be safer for you to build bridges. Thank God those college students felt that they could build bridges with this guy and it ended up changing his life. So that's how I find, that's why I think it's a defensible position because it's actually time sensitive and it's individual sensitive. If you feel that you have this, the, if you feel that you have both the safety and the strength and the desire to step into conflict in that way, and to actually engage, then you should. Because I ultimately believe that the only way that our society changes, the only way that healing can happen for us is because some people are willing to step into the breach and actually ask somebody who's coming from the other direction, I'm just so curious, tell me what it looks like from your perspective. Because I gotta tell you, all my friends and my family and my community, we all see it this way, but you seem to be seeing it differently I'm really curious, and I will tell you that in the since this book came out in just the last couple of weeks, I had a conversation about this very thing with a Muslim friend, and he said to me after I talked about the importance of curiosity and can we wonder about one another, and he said, so help me understand, because a lot of my family and friends and community are really curious about how American Jews understand this moment. It doesn't make sense to us. Can you help me understand? He asked with open-hearted wonder, and I said, I'm so glad that you asked. Let me tell you what I see from my vantage point. And he said, I never thought about that. So the only way that we can find our way to each other is when we actually engage with open-hearted wonder and curiosity. I have to be honest, one of the things this makes me think of when you talk about people just living in different worlds in America in 2024 is Democrats and Republicans. Or should I say, you know, it might not always track onto Democrats and Republicans, but there are people who love, let's say, Donald Trump, and you could insert Joe Biden here, right? And then there are people who say, how could any thoughtful person who right. loves humanity love right. Donald Trump, right? <clears throat> in synagogue life, there are people who demand of their rabbis, of their pastors, you must condemn, and again, I'll use Donald Trump, but one could probably flip this and say Joe Biden. You mu if you're not condemning him, you are not standing up for justice. Meanwhile, there are people in the pews who say, like, I'm a Republican, and, I'm, and I want to feel heard by my pastor. How do you handle that? One of the reasons this is so tricky and so painful is because as I write in, um, in chapter eight, 
I, um, I, I once had a different perspective from one of my teachers, a rabbi, who blasted me in a public article in which he said, if you really hold this view, then you and I simply no longer inhabit overlapping universes, which I was so stunned by, like really baffled by, because I thought that our views were like this far apart and I couldn't understand how he could think that we, that we no longer inhabited overlapping universes. And I spent years thinking about it. And I finally realized that now it's not just that we disagree, it's that we see each other as posing an existential threat to our existence. What I realized after many years of thinking about this and see each other as posing an existential threat to one another. And so this is really hard. And the role of clergy is extremely difficult because at the end of the day, whether you see the world the same way or not, and whether you vote the same way as your congregants or not, you still have to bury your congregants and their loved ones. You still have to name their babies. You still have to bless them at these moments. So it's very hard um, to, 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 to create a kind of rift between your, the pastor and the community or the rabbi and the community. With all of that being said, I really believe from the core of my being that Torah did not survive for thousands of years so that it could be muted precisely at the moment that it matters. And my job is not to rebuke politicians whose views I don't like. My job is to translate Torah, ancient ideas that our people have held sacred for thousands of years into the language of our times to help us understand what it means to be a moral being and to live in a world that is suffering from, a moral, from profound moral crises. So I do not get up and preach about people should vote for this one or this one or condemn this one or this one. I stand up and preach about what it means to be a people that after hundreds of years of enslavement, oppression, and humiliation, partnered with God and journeyed toward liberation, and then were commanded to build a society that would stand in counter testimony to the society that enslaved and humiliated and tortured and oppressed us. That we are left with certain core responsibilities, that that is what it means to be a Jew in the world, and that those responsibilities do not exist only on Shabbat morning when we're in services and then we leave and forget about them. But instead, we go out and, and strive today to build the kind of just and loving society that we have been commanded to build and now for thousands of years have centered in our shared memory and shared responsibility. So in practice, I mean, do your congregants know your politics, do you think? And I don't it... think anyone would be surprised yeah. if they found out who I voted for in the last and, election. And do you ever wonder that you've leaned too hard into your politics and possibly made it harder to minister to anyone because of it? No. No? No. Because again, I see my job as a translator of ancient ideas into our time. Um, and I think that I think that that's what, I, what, what rabbis are called to do. Mm -hmm. I think that we have a sacred responsibility to read our text. And, and again, four of the five books of the Torah are about that journey from enslavement to liberation, from narrowness to expansiveness, from injustice to justice. That is not a political argument. That's, a, that's my faith speaking. That's God and tradition and, and Jewish history, frankly, speaking to me and saying, this is the, this is the moral message that, of, of our time. So I don't, I, I mean, my attempt to translate that into a language for our time um, is, is, a, is one that I do with humility and one that I do, I hope, with real integrity. And there are people in the community who don't see things exactly the way that I do, and they love arguing with me about it. And I love, most of the time, <laughs> receiving those arguments because they help me become better, a better and smarter rabbi. Um, and I, I, t I don't shy away from those kinds of conflicts. I actually, I really do appreciate that. Um, and there are certainly people who would say, you know, I, like, I can't be in that congregation because I know in her heart of hearts that she thinks that my hero is a disgrace, you know, but okay, so then they'll find another synagogue. But most people actually are really grateful to be in a community I've found where the rabbi has something to say and it's really rooted in Torah 
and it actually helps us navigate incredibly confusing and difficult and painful times. Is it harder to be a rabbi to a congregation of several thousands of people than it was when you started out? Do you ever miss having a hundred? I know 150 people showed up to the first, to the, as you say yeah. in the book, 150 people showed up the first night, which is a great, a great beginning, but it's gotten a lot bigger and you can't possibly know everyone as well. And is there stuff that, yeah. that, that's harder to do and that you makes you miss the old the hardest smaller. thing, I don't, I won't say I work more hours now than before because we always, we always, you know, the day was always as, as long as it is um, and the work was never done. But what's harder is that at the heart of the community is really sacred relationships. And I mean, the heart of the book is the argument that we are fundamentally relational beings and that every person needs and deserves to see and to be seen. And it's really hard to see and be seen by thousands of people. And so what does it mean to hold sacred relationship at the heart of community? And so what we've really had to do is figure out how do you become more intimate as you get bigger? Um, and, you know, we hired an incredible team of rabbis. It used to, I used to be the only clergy. Now we, I mean, we have wonderful rabbis who are phenomenal pastors and preachers and able to kind of go out into the community and do a lot of the work. and. Um, and people, I, you know, are very rooted in those relationships now and connected to those relationships as well. And the community pastors to each other in really beautiful ways. I mean, one of the, one of the things that happened after I preached, so I preached a sermon 10 or so years ago called The Amen Effect that was actually the birth of this book in some ways. And it changed the community because what I essentially realized when I, when I was thinking of leading up to High Holy Days that year was that we had spent about a decade, the first decade of Icar, really standing at the intersection of social justice and movements for social change and to build a just and loving world and spirituality and Jewish text and Jewish learning and the revitalization, reanimation of Jewish life. But what I had never once preached in the first decade of Icar was that you cannot build the beloved community out in the world, a world of justice and love and dignity, a redemptive world, if you do not fight to build the beloved community among the people that you are closest to. And so, and that means we fundamentally needed to learn how to turn to one another and show up with love and treat one another justly and treat one another with tenderness and care. And so I preached this sermon that was essentially go to the funeral, just show up because I don't care how you vote and what you're fighting for and who you're protesting for. If you don't show up for your neighbor when your neighbor's in need, we will never build a just reality. And what happened after that sermon was like the community changed. I mean, people literally started showing up for shivas in a different way than we did before and showing up at the bedside and making lasagna for each other and just being in each other's lives. So even as we've grown bigger, it's now the responsibility is not just on the rabbis to pastor to the community, but we pastor to each other. The community takes care of each other in a really beautiful way. So the ethos of the community is about each of, it's not about me and it's not about my rabbinic team. It's actually about all of us stepping forward with love um, toward one another precisely at the moments when our instincts would pull us further away. So I, you, you end the book with eight tips for practicing the Amen effect. And I, I want to do a lightning round and ask about all of those. Okay. But I want to do that at the very end. Um, I, are there questions from, from any of our guests here for Rabbi Browse? I think that in the immediate aftermath of October 7th, there was such a profound shock to the system for many, many Jews. Um, we were in such a deep anguish, both because of what happened on October 7th, and then um, and then it was amplified by the response of many people around the world um, who either remained silent or actively justified and even celebrated what had happened, these atrocities that were committed, um, that the way that I've been thinking about it in the last few m weeks and months is that when you're in Shiva, you stay in your house and you tend to those wounds, and you are surrounded by love. And the people who care most about you come into your home and bring you food and make sure that you're taking care of yourself. 
you're not building bridges. And then you realize at a certain point that you can't stay in Shiva in the house of mourning forever. And so you have to get up and we have this ritual which I speak about in, one, in, in a different context in the book, but we have this beautiful ritual, which I'm sure many of you have done at the end of Shiva, when we actually get up and we walk around the block. And that ritual is a re, it's an invitation to re-enter the world. And so when you get up, you're, you're lifted. My father died in, in August, um, just before Rosh Hashanah. And I mean, we were in that house for a week together, every meal, you know, the whole family surrounded by community, and then we got up at the end of Shiva and you you walk around the block and you just see that like, oh, this neighbor got a new dog. And oh, this person also had a death in the family. I wonder how they're doing. And oh my God, these guys just bought a new house. How, you know, how sweet. And you like your, your, this, your circle of moral concern extends beyond your immediate. But you can't do that when your pain is in its most acute form. And you can't do that when you're in deep trauma. And so what you have to do is like recognize that this is not a moment when I can go out and like build new relationships and try to gain new perspectives by calling somebody who said something that hurt my feelings on the radio and say like, hey, friend, who I just don't know, who I don't yet know, I, you know, tell me, uh, how did you come to that point of view? Um, but if you're in relationship already, it makes it a little bit easier. And I had a few of those experiences myself, like even from the depths of my anguish, I reached out to a few longtime friends who I was very, who I was hurt by, who I either hadn't heard from or had done things that I felt were hurtful or said things that I, that I was hurt, hurt by. And, and then you can lean into the curiosity and to the wonder and to the kind of attempt to start rebuilding, restitching the fabric that's been so torn apart. But it's really hard to do that when you're in the depths of it. And in the case of a national or collective trauma or tragedy, we're all in different places. Like there's no seven day calculation here. This is an extended shiva that people are in. And so some people feel really ready to start to re-engage and should. That's what I'm saying about some people, like some of us have the bandwidth and some of us don't. I'm in a different uh, pl position spiritually than my brother who lives in Renana, who's, um, whose son, goes to the school that's right next to the bus stop where there was a car ramming attack a couple weeks ago and was home with COVID that day. But all of his friends were not home and were at that bus stop and they were all like deep, terribly wounded. And one of them remains in critical condition. My brother and his family feel that they are in a very different, they have a different kind of bandwidth for reaching out with empathy and curiosity and wonder than I have. And so I don't feel shame that I'm safer because I'm in LA and you know for a little for a little bit more distant I feel like great I'm now maybe I can be in the position of some of those college students with Derek Black that my brother really you know maybe he can't right now because he's just he's worried like are my kids going to get in be get to bed safely tonight so that's what I mean about you, you know sort of gauging what we have the bandwidth for but I believe that the Torah ultimately the Torah of curiosity is what we're ultimately called to and can we find a way um, you know, if not in the moments of acute trauma and grief, but ultimately, can we find a way to see the humanity in each other and to cherish each other's humanity and to lift up the shared values that we do have? Because I really believe, and I know that some of you might contest this, at the end of the day, that most human beings just want to put their kids to bed safely at night. Most people. Now, there's some awful people who will break that. You know, you, you can call me a liar because you can tell me the names of a bunch of different people and organizations that don't care about that. But most human beings just want to put their children to bed safely at night. Can we start from that starting point and, and then look to one another with curiosity and compassion? This book is rooted in Jewish wisdom. Um, it is not written for a just Jewish audience. I actually believe that the book is for anybody who's ever had a broken heart or anybody who's ever cared about somebody who's ever had a broken heart. Um, and so it is, to, it is actually written for a broad audience. And some of my um, most intriguing readers so far have been, um, have been Christians who are really fascinated 
by the way that Jews read text, um, because I, I, I bring a lot of Jewish text in the, th throughout the book, but I just, even as a rabbi at, at Ikar, I never assume that all the people in the room come from a certain particular perspective or have, you know, ha have a certain level of Jewish background, education reading. So it's really written to be uh, for broad audiences. And so far, we're finding that it is being, um, thankfully, read by people um, both within and outside the Jewish community. Can I, I actually want to rephrase the second question because there's an episode in the book that goes to it where you talk about people showing up for funerals. Like in one case, a woman showed up to to, to hold the hand of some a mother who had lost a son and she didn't know the mother, right? She just yeah. heard that it was going to happen yeah. and she showed up at the funeral. And I've seen, I've thought about this a lot in my own reporting about people who meaning well go to shivas where they aren't necessarily known. And some people are very moved by that and love it. But some people, to use your language, don't have the same vocabulary. Yeah. They don't realize what a mitzvah is and they're freaked out by it. Yeah. And so I think that, you know, an interesting way to look at that question is, do you have to check your own impulse to do good deeds against what other people might be needing or feeling at the same time. Okay, great. And I, those might be two different questions or the same. So I, I'll, I'll, I'll just say, I start the book by talking about um, this beautiful family in our community that suffered a real, truly horrific tragedy. Um, both of their kids were killed by a drunk driver. They were also in the car and they both survived. Um, and the book starts in their shiva. Um, in their living room. And the mother is telling me that her own mother used to detest the people who would come to Shiva who didn't know the family. She called them licky loos. And like they're do it's like a rubbernecking, you know, delay. And they're, they're, they're like, I can't believe what happened over there. And maybe they're bagels. And maybe they're bagels, <laughs> right. But, but she, and so she's concerned, like how she, so we're in her packed living room and she said this to me and she's like, how do I understand all of these people who are here? I don't even know a lot of these people. And then she answers her own question because she essentially remembers that another bereaved mother in our community who she got in touch with, I mean, we, we put her in touch with this mother, like the day after her tragedy said to her, listen to me, your home is the scariest place on earth right now. Anybody who shows up in that house is a friend. And she said that awareness that all of the people who were there were there with love sh shifted her whole perspective. By the way, um, she is an extraordinary writer herself. Um, her, name, uh, um, her name is Gail Lerner and her husband, Colin Campbell, wrote a book about grief that's re that you should all read. That's called um, Finding the Words that was essentially, he's not Jewish. And the book is about how Jewish ritual essentially helped him and his wife survive this unthinkable tragedy. And um, and so I think about that all the time. There are certainly people who overstep their boundaries and who stay too long and who they're like the first to show up and they come a 30 minutes before the Shiva time and they don't want to leave. Okay, don't do that, right? <laughs> but in general, the fear of overstepping boundaries must not keep us away. Right. Like and what Gail and Colin actually did was they created with the help uh, with our help and with the help of another bereaved mother, a set of rules. Here's what would be here's what will help us and here's what will not help us. And they put the rules at the entrance to their home on a piece of paper and everyone who came in read those rules. And those rules said things like we want to talk about our children please don't avoid asking us about our kids. We want to hear about your kids, but we don't want to hear too much about your kids. So please don't pretend that you don't have children because you're afraid that talking about them will break our hearts. Our hearts are already broken and we love your kids, but don't go off on a tangent about how your poor kid didn't get into the AP sociology class that they want to get into and talk about it for an hour because that would be really insensitive to people who just lost their children. So th in other words, they actually literally articulated what would be helpful and what would not. And, and for the community, this was a godsend. I mean, because we were all terrified terrified. But the answer is not to stay away. The answer is to be humble and to like, not don't come early, don't leave late, but show up, just show up. I also heard Susan in you a, a slightly different question. So this is answering Mark's yeah. question, but I heard something a little different and maybe I'm wrong here, but I, th I thought you were sort of speaking more to the curiosity chapter eight, like who's in that courtyard and what does it mean to see the people that we don't, that, that have really hurt us. And 
Like, so what if we're playing by the rules and we're invested in approaching someone with curiosity and compassion and care, and they don't have curiosity and compassion and care for us? So isn't that a little bit unfair? And the answer is, yeah, it's, re it's, it's terrible. <laughs> it feels terrible. And I think, if I may, that part of the reason that post-October 7th was so painful for so many Jews was because many of us felt that we had spent years turning to the right and circling around and keeping our gaze up and seeing who's coming from this direction, who I can be a good ally to and who I can support and whose voice I can amplify and who I can fight for and who, you know, who I will vote so that policies will help. I have been, I have been that loving, supportive friend and now I'm walking to the left and nobody's catching me. I think that's part of the reason that so many Jews felt such an existential loneliness after these, tra you know, these, these terrible atrocities occurred. Um, and it might make you say, okay, fine, I will never again walk to the right and lift my eyes. I am just gonna barrel through life now and I'm not showing up for anyone else, but that would be a terrible way to live and a terrible lesson to take from this because ultimately what we want to build is a society of love and justice. We want to build a society of love and justice. And the only way to do that is to live with compassion and with curiosity toward the other. And if others don't approach us that way, we tend to our own broken hearts. We find other friends, maybe who are also walking to the left. And many of us did. We took great solace in the Jewish community during those early days when we're like, where are my friends? Where are my partners? We found the solace we needed with each other. And ultimately, not everybody abandoned the Jews. I'm sorry to break our you know, myth about ourselves, but some people did and it's really painful, but there were also lots of people who were coming this way who did reach out with love and care. And I'm sure each of you can tell stories of the random friend from high school who, you know, or the, or the pastor who did reach out even though three pastors didn't reach out. You know, like there, despite our sense of abandonment of the world, we have each other and we weren't fully abandoned, if we're honest about it. So, so we start to see the world from a slightly different vantage point. We nurse our own broken hearts. And eventually, we realize that the only choice we have is to continue to lead with love. And maybe one day we will be received with the love that we put into the world. And if we're not, I'm sorry to tell you, but like as Jews, we don't build, strive to build a just world so that other people will be nice to us when we're in pain. We strive to build a just world because we were enslaved in Egypt. And when we came out, God said, don't ever let the world look like the world that you live, that you suffered in over there. So we're in this for the long haul. We're out to build a just society. That is our goal. Um, and it's very painful when other people don't see us in our own pain, but that's no reason to leave the fight. It only makes us, if we can, when we can, redouble our efforts to build relationships, to turn to others with curiosity and to continue to, you know, to fight the good fight. Um, so I want to quickly just like give me two or three sentences on each of the eight tips because okay. I think I, I think in it, the book's worth reading entirely. But as a primer, this is what I'm going to pin above my you know above yeah. my dresser and say, am I doing these things? Okay. So the first you've spoken to number one, you say go to the funeral. Yeah. Why, why should we go to the funeral? You just show up. You never regret going to the funeral. You might be late to your deadline. You might have to reschedule 17 meetings. You never say, God, that was a waste of time, you know, hearing about that person's life and supporting a friend in need. That was such a waste of time. Go to the funeral. You just have to show up for the funeral, for the shiva, for the wedding, for the bat mitzvah, for the joy and for the pain. You just show up. For the breasts. For the breasts. For the breasts. Even for, for, the, breasts. Even for the breasts. You don't have to stand in the front row, but you got to be there. Now, number two, you say meet your neighbors, which I think is so interesting. Yeah. I'm so interested in the way that urban landscape affects the practice of Judaism. You know, some people don't have neighbors, but you know, they're living a mile apart or they're living mm -hmm. in ex-Serbia and they have to drive everywhere and whatever. So, but what can we all take for the, from the idea of meet your neighbors? Okay. Did you know that 30% of Americans do not know the names of their next door neighbors? Did you know that? That's really bad. That's bad. We're all running through our heads. And, do I know my neighbor? Do I know my neighbor? I know my neighbor. By the way, it's not just, it doesn't just make us bad neighbors. It actually is endangering our society because as I describe in chapter eight, Hannah Arendt writes in the, you know, t great, brilliant 20th century philosopher that loneliness and isolation and social alienation are pre, are preconditions for tyranny. 
And they are preconditions for conspiracy theories taking root in a society. You cannot have a society in which you believe the, con the ridiculous conspiracy theories about your neighbors if you know your neighbors. We have got to get to know our neighbors. So practice number two is take a walk around your block as often as you possibly can and say hello to every person that you pass on the street and get to know your neighbors. It actually matters. This is why we should have dogs, because they have. then you have to get out of the this house. This is why we should have dogs. Why we should have dogs. Number three is honor the divine image. <laughs> Honor the divine image. So this is about um, this is about actually taking a moment in the course of your busy day to take seriously what is the most core foundational Jewish principle of human beings, which is that every single human being is created in God's own image, and actually think about that before you step over a person lying down on the ground outside of the Starbucks. Like just think about that and then see how your behavior would shift if you actually took that seriously. Like you think you're a good, a good Jew, a good Christian, a good Muslim. We all share this foundational principle that every human being is created in God's image. So what would happen if we actually imagined enacting that? Number four, start by serving. So, I mean, this is, some it's not this is not to say that we don't need solitude and that we don't need um, time to process on our own and work through uh, you know work through our struggles but isolating ourselves further from community often does not help us figure out what our core purpose and mission is in the world but stepping forward in service does actually doing something gracious for another human being helps us figure out who we are in the world and actually helps another person often through incredibly difficult moments. And so start by serving, like wake up each day and say, what is one act of service that I can do today for another person? Um, and if it's an unexpected act of service, even better. Just a simple act of kindness. Like when Melissa brings me a chocolate croissant in the morning and I didn't ask for it and I'm like, God, <laughs> what an act of love. I have to say in some ways you had a moment in there <laughs> I'm not going to say you made fun of the person who thought she was going to find her purpose up on yeah. the mountain, yeah. but you kind of made fun of her a little. I mean, it was the hottest take, especially in L.A., which yeah. was you're not going to find yourself by yourself. Yeah. It's actually going off to the retreat and the spa and the walk in the woods and in the desert and the eat, and pray, love is again, not. Again, take vacations, take sabbaticals. I really believe in that. But ultimately, I mean, the way that we break out of loneliness is by serving. Mm -hmm. That's what we do. We show up for one another with unexpected acts of grace. And that is very ancient and very much a part of our tradition and part of lots of traditions. And if you talk to the Surgeon General, Dr. Vivek Murthy has been writing so brilliantly about loneliness, he will say that the mo like one of the most important pathways out of loneliness is service. It's just showing up for someone else in an act of grace. Take a joy break is number okay. five. Okay, here we go. Okay. <laughs> so my, my beloved friend um, lost her partner to a really terrible um, cancer. And they had, <laughs> and they had just fallen in love and it was a deep and beautiful love and they were together for a few years and they deserved to live a really long, beautiful life um, together. And then he got very sick and he, the, his last uh, few months were terrible. And he died and she was grieving and she had this realization shortly after he died that the reason that she fell in love with him was because he was the embodiment of joy in this world, that he was always laughing, he had wonderful friends. He had the best stories. He was the life of the party. And she's like, I can't be one of those widows who's just like, uh, you know, like in sitting in sackcloth and ashes every day because I, I, want, I want to honor who he was in the world. So she set a timer for 18 minutes and she forced herself to experience 18 minutes of joy in his memory as an expression of grief every single day for the year um, for, for her year of mourning. And so she would like dance, you know, blast music in her apartment and dance alone in her apartment. She would walk into nature. She would eat amazing food. She would call an old friend and just laugh and tell stories. Like she just did things that she knew would feel good for her spirit and for her body as an expression of grief, as an act of resistance, as an act of self-love. 
So I decided in solidarity to take a joy break with her. And I do this. I do this. Like, I re I'm like, okay, a hot shower. Like, that will give me joy right now. Like, something, a glass of wine at the end of a long day. Like, a conversation with a, with a friend about, like, just tell a stupid story. You know, like, something that will fill, fill us with joy because it changes us. It changes our bodies and it changes our spirits. Do you have a, an app or a timer? I ask in all sincerity. Do you I have don't. A, do you have a no, reminder? I, I, do, to, I don't actually have a, I don't use a timer. She does. Does. And she tracked it, by the way, and I hope she'll write a book called 18 Minutes of Joy um, because I want to, like, just really, she she wrote down every single thing that she did for the whole year to hold joy. And it's such a beautiful gift. It's to, her, to herself and to all of us. So, so number six out of eight, uh, number six, don't grin and bear it. Yeah, just tell the truth. Like, when the, when the people who were brokenhearted hmm. walked into the temple... They did not turn to the right and circle with everybody else. They went against the current. And, and there's something very powerful about saying like, I'm not like you right now. I am broken and I need somebody to see me in my brokenheartedness. I'm not gonna say I'm okay when I'm not okay. And so this is like literally, I talk about my friend Greg in this, in this um, practice who, when his father died very tragically and suddenly, and he really struggled. I mean, he had a horrible, hard year of grief. He was in his 20s and, you know, and people would say to him like, hey buddy, how's it going? And he just decided he wasn't gonna lie anymore. And he would say like, really shitty, it's really bad. I really miss my dad today. And he realized at some point that that was a spiritual practice and that telling the truth was actually helping him grieve and ultimately helping him heal. So the practice is just tell the truth about where your broken heart is. That's another one that hits really close to home because I have a memory a few years ago of saying to someone who was a friend of mine, um, how are you doing? And getting one of those answers like, like really badly. And I took it so personally, like I was just oh. as if, as if, I'd wronged her somehow. I made it about me. Like, oh, I wronged you. Oh, yeah. I shouldn't have asked. And I, I'm, I'm no, haunted by that. You didn't but, wrong her. You righted her by asking. And right. she righted you by telling she the truth. She righted me by telling the <laughs> truth. Okay, number seven, rounding the corner, be present. The idea of chapter seven, I'm not going to give it all away, is that we live in a culture in which we think it's our responsibility to fix each other. Like, you felt bad that your friend told you she wasn't okay. Right. Because you wanted to make her okay. You right. don't want, we don't want to be around. We don't want to be in that discomfort. And actually... What we need to do is just be in the pain with people. Like think of Adam and Eve in that dark night of the soul. We just need to be with each other in the pain. And so, um, so here I share a little story um, that I, I heard years and years ago about, you know, one of these kids who was going through a toxic teenage phase where like everything is tumultuous and everything's a landmine and everything. And, and so the mom one day is like, I got it. And she says to the kid, I have a chocolate babka and I'm gonna be in the kitchen at midnight if you wanna share it with me. And then that's it. And so she goes and sits in the kitchen at midnight and like the kid doesn't show up. And then she says the next day, like I'm gonna be back in the kitchen at midnight with another chocolate babka. And she sits there in the kitchen and the kid doesn't show up but she goes back night after night after night after night and you will not believe what happens. <laughs> Months pass. And one night at 11.59, that teenager shows up in the kitchen and says like, Ima, can I have some babka? And they sit down together. And so this is like, just be present. Like, just stay, just stay there. Just stay in it. It's hard. The person's struggling. You're not getting the answer you want. Your job is not to make your friend okay when she's grieving. Your job is to not run away from her when she's grieving. So just be present. Just stick with it. They literally broke bread together at 11.59. They, they broke Bob good. I tell you, when I yeah. read this, I thought, well, I'm the best dad in the world because I'm in the kitchen every night at midnight. <laughs> eating junk food and binging TV. And my daughter's free, my, my surly daughter's free to come join me anytime. I just have to tell her that, right? Because I'm always, you just have to tell always her. there. And the last one you wrote at the very end of the book is stay at the table. Yeah. And this is, this is related to the question that I think a few of you have been asking about, which is, you know, it's really hard when the person who we're engaging doesn't see the world our way especially when we're living in this time where we see each other as existential threats. If you can stay at the table, stay at the table, stay in the conversation, respond with curiosity. I share a bunch of stories in that chapter. They're all amazing stories, I think. 
Um, so you'll have to, you know, you have to read for yourself. But <laughs> of what of what it means to try to hold curiosity when somebody sees the world like this and you see it like that, and just what can you learn and what might happen? And the answer is, if you can be safe. And the answer is, it's possible that nothing happens but you did not waste your time staying at that table because something in you, something in you might change. And it's very possible that you might plant a seed in your curiosity and your wonder and your presence, you might plant a seed at that table that might end up changing this person's heart. Bye bye, Sharon Browse. Thank you for talking Mark to me today. Thank you, thank you so, all. Can, can I say, can I do one last thing? Yeah. So um, I mentioned that my father died in uh, just a couple weeks before Rosh Hashanah. And so I'm in my year of turning to the left and walking around and hoping that I will be held with, um, with amens and with love. Um, and so I, I want to ask if I can say mourner's Kaddish to close our evening together. And I wonder if there's any other mourner in the room, um, either someone observing a yard site, the anniversary of a death of a loved one, or someone who's in the grieving period. And would you be willing to share who you're grieving? Um, sure. Um, it's, it was last night, my father's yard site, and unbelievable, it's 25 years. Oh, thank you. What's his name? Meyer. Meyer. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who's grieving? Okay, so we'll, um, we'll stand and I'll, I'll just, uh, wait, no, no, wait, not everybody. <laughs> just the two of us, but at Ikar, I like to do it so that just the mourners stand so that we can see uh, who's mourning. And it also takes a lot of courage to stand up in a room when everyone else is seated um, and to just say, my heart's broken now um, today. And I just appreciate you uh, saying amen to my, to my brokenheartedness and I will give you the same gift uh, one day. And, uh, and so thank you for, for seeing me and I hope that I can see you as well. So um, for the rest of us, I will ask um, if you don't mind just saying amen to our prayer. Yitkadal v'yikadash shemei rabah. Amen. Be'amad divrach yirtei ve'amlich machutei v'chayechon v'yomechon v'chayei d'cho b'yit Yisrael ba'agalat v'zman kari v'imru. Amen. Yehei shemei rabah mevorach le'olam o'mei o'maya yiparach v'yishtabach v'yitpa'ar v'yitromam v'yitnaseh v'yitadar v'yitalev v'yitalal shemei d'kudsha v'ruchu le'ilam inkol v'yirchata v'shirata tush b'chata v'nechemata d'amiran be'ama v'imru. Amen. Yehei shlama rabba min shemaya v'chayim aleinu v'akol Yisrael v'imru. Amen. Osei shalom b'romav hu ya'asei shalom aleinu v'akol Yisrael v'imru. Amen. Amen. May Mayor's memory be a blessing and my father Rick's memory be a blessing and and to all of you I hope that the this is the ritualization of care. Amen, 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 amen. It's a muscle memory. We're training ourselves to show up and to stay present and to just be the love and support and care um, that, we, that we all need. So thank you so much. Thank you.